If you want a great career, you're going to have to create it. This is Forward Tilt by Praxis. The other day on the Praxis uh, online community, I posted an observation that credit cards, uh, which apparently they've been like this in in Europe for some time, but in the United States, it's a recent phenomenon that instead of swiping with the magnetic strip, you've got this little chip. It's like like a rectangular chip on the front of the card and you slide your card into a reader and then it has to sit there for a few seconds to verify. And apparently this is more secure um, for the credit card at least on the digital end. And my my comment was, what I found interesting is I've never left my credit card behind anywhere until they switch to this chip thing because often you stick it in and then you leave it there while you're waiting for it to process. And then you've got kids, you know, in my case, kids that I'm watching and things are kind of scrambling around and I'm putting groceries in bags and then it clears and the receipt prints, you take the receipt and you leave. And I've left the credit card behind twice. And so I, I wondered, you know, on net, is the security any better because human patterns that have emerged of, of checkout process when the credit card never has to leave your hand because you swipe, you're not going to leave it behind very often. But when you have to leave it in something for a few seconds, naturally a human wants to use those few seconds to do something else. And now their mind is off the credit card. It's not in your hand and it's easier to leave behind. So it's possible. And I don't know if this is true. I haven't looked at any data on this, but it's possible that any gains in security from the improvement digitally of the chip from the swipe may be overcome by losses in security for the fact that more people are physically leaving their credit card behind with this new system. And so it was just one of those observations and it spurred a discussion and somebody mentioned, oh, well, Europe has done this for a while and it's not a big deal. It makes more sense. And somebody else sort of jokingly said, well, this is just as makes just as little sense as all these other things from Europe that are supposedly better, like the metric system. And and someone's like, what is wrong with the metric system? It's so much more precise. And I, I have always found this to be a fascinating discussion. The metric system was designed rationally, consciously designed to accomplish something with precision, which is to be able to measure in labs and things like that, and to be able to convert from one form of measurement to another, to convert from you know, different volume to length and all these things that have a uniformity across. And it works very well for that. So technicians and specialists usually love it. But what it doesn't account for, and the reason the imperial system has lived on in the United States for so long, much to the chagrin of central planners and teachers and rationalists and those who are uh, big into what what F.A. Hayek called scientism, um, they wish that everything would be metric. It's so much more rational. But the reason it ta- it's so hard for it to latch on here is because the imperial system, even though it has all these different kinds of measurement it's so much more natural to our everyday patterns of behavior. Our brains have a hard time with very large numbers. So if you say someone is six feet tall, that's pretty easy to grasp. And a foot is a pretty like common sense measure. It's about the size of a typical foot or the size of when you hold your hands apart, you know, shoulder like in front of you, shoulder width apart. An inch is about the size of when you hold your thumb and your finger out. It's roughly an inch. Those are common measurements. Six feet makes sense. Saying 130 centimeters, um, 130, that's a lot. It's harder for your brain to grasp. It's not a unit that's as naturally uh, accessible. And the same with temperature. 100 sounds like that's hot. I'm going to be really hot, maybe too hot. Zero sounds like I'm going to be too cold. It's very intuitive saying, you know, 37 to minus 17 or, or whatever. I don't even know the Celsius. It's harder to know. And the, the changes in degree are so much smaller. You have to start using decimals and that's very unnatural. Like to know that a difference in one or two degrees of temperature, you can actually feel the, that difference. That's a more intuitive system. And that's why it sort of has evolved. And, and, you know, a cup, a tablespoon, a teaspoon, these are kind of ingrained in the patterns of everyday life. They were not rationally planned from, from sort of on high. They kind of emerged over years and years of convention and use, and they relate to pre-existing patterns of human behavior. Now, that's a really important observation. There was actually a magazine called Design for emergence. And they asked me to, to write an article for them one time. And my, my co- colleague TK Coleman and I did, but the, the theme of the 
magazine is really fascinating to me. It's this concept of understanding that these kind of orders and institutions and norms emerge out of natural human patterns and tendencies. And can we design, whether it's neighborhoods, software, uh, institutions, homes, living rooms, to allow for patterns to emerge. So this would almost be the idea of, you know, instead of paving sidewalks where you think people will walk between buildings, paving the cow paths, you know, letting letting the natural patterns of where people walk emerge and then paving over those. You've seen this on college campuses many times. We'll have this beautiful setup of sidewalks that are all symmetrical, but nobody's using them. They're walking on these little dirt paths in between because it's more efficient and convenient for their normal patterns. And so rather than trying to rationally plan ahead of time what you think makes sense on paper, letting patterns emerge and sort of working with those rhythms. One of my favorite thinkers, Christopher Alexander, is an architect, and he has several phenomenal books. And they're all basically around this theme that observing patterns of human behavior and working with them in your design, in your construction, everything from where windows are within a building to where streets are in a city. You know, humans are drawn to light. We're phototropic. So if you have, and we also want a place to sit down when we're in a room. So if you have a a window with light, but the only place to sit down is on the other end, there's a tension in that room that you subconsciously experience. You're drawn to the window, but you're drawn to the chair. Whereas if you have a chair positioned toward a window, that tension is resolved. It's in harmony with those natural patterns. So I have tried to use this insight of kind of spontaneous order, emergent order, natural human patterns, and how institutions, products, technologies, you know, communication styles, habits, if you build them based on what seems rational, but it doesn't take into account the way that these patterns emerge and the fact that they emerge for a reason, taking that into account and leaving room, designing for emergence, leaving room for those patterns to sort of be an integral part resolves that tension. And so I try to do this in in my own life even, to observe my own patterns of behavior, to observe the things that I'm naturally drawn to, the ways that I naturally like to relate or spend my energy or time or communicate. And rather than working against them, try to work with those rhythms, try to work with those patterns. And it's the same if you own a business or you're selling products, trying to get people to do something that doesn't come natural to them and then being mad when they don't do it. You know, it doesn't work that way. I mean, this is why, you know, before you launch a product saying, I'm going to survey all my friends and, and ask them if they think this product's a good idea. They're all going to say yes because it's free to say yes. And their natural tendency is they want you to feel good. And you say, hey, does this product sound cool? And they're going to say, yeah, that sounds cool. And then you design it and go to sell it and nobody's willing to part with their money. You were sort of not taking into account the natural incentives humans face when, when it's free to have an opinion the opinion they give you isn't going to be very valuable. They're not having to put their money there. If you if you can put it out there and put money attached to it and see who buys it, right? You'll learn from their from their behavior rather than trying to plan to it. So anyway, whether you're building software or just building your own daily structure and schedule, think about natural human patterns. Don't get mad at them. Don't say I hate it that everybody when you get into the left lane and speed up, the person in the right lane also speeds up. Rather than getting mad at it, try to observe that pattern and say, okay, there's something interesting going on here. If I'm going to achieve what I want, I want to sort of work with this pattern. This is a natural human tendency. I don't want to try to rationally plan around it and respond by saying, let's make a law that no one can speed up when someone's trying to pass them. You know what we should do? We should put speed bumps in the right lane so that half people have to slow down. (laughs) That's, That's the rationalist trying to force those patterns to be different than they are. Rather than trying to understand where they emerged from, allow for their existence and continued existence and try to change the incentive structure to work with those rather than against them. Want more Forward Tilt? Go to discoverpraxis.com slash forward tilt to get a free ebook and every episode delivered to your inbox. Mm -hmm.